the fence. The complaint references a statute that in its uh, many subparts does identify a substance called naphthalindol, but the statute sets forth eight different chemical constituents, each and individually, which when made part of naphthalindol constitutes the naphthalindol that is illegal to possess. The lab report in this case prescribes or actually found a different, a different type of naphthalindol. The key being in each of the lab report subparts, there's a chemical in there called florin, fluoropentyl. And if you compare the lab report to the statute, they don't match up. Counsel, is any of that in the record? It is. I mean, I understand the lab report's in the record. And I'll, I'll follow your pronunciation. Naphtholindol, is yes, that how sir. you say it? The lab report says that naphtholindol was in the packets, right? It says naphtholindol, and then it gives the actual chemical breakdown. I understand, but it, it, that evidence is there and was before the court. Yes. And you didn't challenge it, the lab report as far as having an erroneous chemical description of naphtholindol. Correct. So aren't we stuck with that evidence as being before the court and being um, sufficient to support the holding? It wasn't challenged before the district court. And the lab report says what it says, and it says naphtholindol was in the packets. Well, what, what, the, what the lab report says is naphtholindol AM2201. And as the finder of fact, I believe it was incumbent upon the trial judge to take the lab report, <clears throat> excuse me, lay the lab report down next to the statute and compare them and see if the lab report matches the chemical descriptions that are available in the statute. And I respectfully suggest that they do not. That, that seems to be asking a lot of a district court to sort of have some deep level of chemical knowledge. It strikes me that if you wanted to challenge that fact, the chemical c content would have required at a minimum some examination of the individuals that prepared the lab report or your own expert testimony, something along those lines. Rhetorically speaking, uh, I believe the burden would have been on the state to come in and provide an expert to match up the lab report to the statute. And instead of just putting in the lab report, I believe it was incumbent upon the prosecution and bore the burden of proof to say, this lab report matches the statute. Here's our expert. Now, I cannot expand upon the record, and I am no chemist. I'll, I concede that. And if, like I said, I cannot expand upon the record. But what I did provide the court in my supplemental briefing were the only other two case precedents nationally to address the specific chemical in the incense packets here. One was out of Utah, and one was out of Pennsylvania. And they both said that when you see the chemical designation AM-2201, those courts found that that is an analog. So while I don't have an expert report, neither does the state. The state had the burden of proof here to show that what the chemical designations were in its lab report matched up to the statute. Instead, they just handed this, the, the lab report to the judge. Now, the trial judge in this instance is acting as the trier of fact. And this is where we dovetail back into McFadden. As the trier of fact, the Alleman case, it's a court of appeals case from 2009, but the Alleman case states what I think is pretty axi axiomatic, and that is that a trial judge sitting as the trier of fact must follow the same jury instructions that the trial judge would have given to the jury. I don't believe that there'd be any debate about that. In this instance, if we know as a matter of law that AM2201 is an analog, then the trial judge was required to make the findings under pick fourth 57050. And setting pick, all of, sorry, setting aside the substance, can you address the procedural hurdle that you have in that I, this issue was not presented to the Court of Appeals, was it? Uh, it, it was. I did raise sufficiency of evidence, but, but and, not and this, I understand where you're going. Right. Okay. But we are, we, our jurisdiction is based on a review of the Court of Appeals opinion, and I don't see any mention of this argument of uh, their analysis 
And I, so we have nothing to review from the Court of Appeals. So how do we get to the your issue? Okay. We start with what I raised in the Court of Appeals, which is that this is a controlled substance analog and McFadden applies. That has never changed. I briefed it. The Court of Appeals addressed it. They found that McFadden shouldn't apply. In my petition for review, I raised the same issue. <clears throat> there is some case law that I, that I have, uh, well, let me, let me get to it rather than... Well, when you say you raised the same issue, you just mean sufficiency of the evidence. Mm -hmm. you, never, you never made this chemical content argument prior to supplemental briefing here, did you? Well, it's incumbent upon the state, as I understand preservation law, the state has to be the one to raise the fact that I have not preserved this. The state did not brief this. However, the state is actually the one that opened the door to this. In its supplemental brief, the state came forward for the first time and said, whoa, 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 McFadden doesn't apply because this is not a controlled substance analog case. McFadden doesn't apply because we charge this under the controlled substance statute. All right? So the state is the one that brought this issue up, not me. In response, what I've pointed out to the court is, let's go back to the record. The record is the lab report. What's the lab report say? The lab report says that this is AM2201. Then I provide this court with two cases, one out of Utah, one out of Pennsylvania, the only two in the country, that have addressed AM2201, and they uniformly state it's an analog. If it's an analog, what we know from Kansas law is that pick fourth 57050 applies, and this brings us full circle back to McFadden, which is the elements in that pick are the same elements that the Supreme Court addressed in McFadden. They are not any elements or any findings that the trial judge came anywhere near addressing in his findings when he pronounced her guilt. They weren't even on his radar. So on one hand, I believe that uh, we have a sufficiency of evidence issue in that the state is contending we charge this as a, control, as a controlled substance case, not an analog case. If that's what we're having, that's why I submit you take the lab report, you look at the chemical compound identified in the lab report, and you go to the specific uh, part of 65-4105, which is incorporated into the controlled substance statute, and that's where we find in subsection H the definition prescribed by the legislature for what naphtholindol is and can be. There are eight separate components. They don't all have to, all eight don't have to be part of the naphtholindol molecule, but one of the eight has to be. And then if you go back to the lab report, the fluorin, I'm mispronouncing it, I believe it's fluoropentyl, that's not one of the eight. AIM2201, AM not one of the eight. But what we know from Utah and Pennsylvania, both those courts found this is a subject for expert testimony. The state's got the burden of proof. That's an analog. So what we really have here is this, we have a Fitzgerald situation from earlier this year. The state charged a controlled substance crime and proved an analog. And if that's, if that's the situation, the state had a chance before its closing argument perhaps to amend and say, wait a second, we charged this wrong, it should be an analog crime. They didn't. So where we're at here, the state charged one offense, proved another, proved possession or distribution of AM2201, not of the naphtholindol in the statute. In that instance, I believe that the Fitzgerald case dictates that sufficiency of evidence was not met. However, if the court says, well, sufficiency's difficult concept, then I suggest you have to look at 57050 and whether those elements were properly considered by the court. I don't believe anybody can, can state or even presume that the district court judge was even aware of 57050, talked about it, made no findings whether the additional elements of 57050 were present on the record. So it would seem at, at best, this case should be reversed due to insufficiency at worst. I'm not sure how you would get to it as a remedy procedurally, but it would seem that at the very worst, Ms. Rizal would be entitled to a new trial where the, the proper precedent is followed, that being McFadden, and that the uh, pick elements that Kansas law states should apply to an analog case are taken under consideration by the trier of fact. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, counsel.
Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, I'm Jacob Gonteski. I represent the plaintiff, the appellee in this case, the state of Kansas. I'm here today arguing that this case was properly charged, she was convicted on sufficient evidence, and McFadden does not apply to this case because Ms. Rizal simply was not convicted of possessing with intent to distribute an analog. She was convicted of possessing a listed controlled substance in Kansas. All the primary evidence from this case demonstrates as much. When you go back through the record, you'll find every piece of evidence in this case mentioned the controlled substance that she was convicted of. The amended complaint charged Ms. Rizal with possessing a naphthoylindol. It stated she possessed this, this controlled substance, in quotes, within a thousand feet of a school. That's from the amended complaint. In the stipulation, the parties agreed that the packets contained cannabinoids and pointed to the lab report. In the lab report, the substances were defined as AM2201, comma, A naphthoylindol. In the verdict, when the district court convicted Ms. Rizal, the verdict was that she possessed a naphthoylindol and that she possessed this controlled substance within a thousand feet of a school. The journal entry references possession of K2 and cites to the statute 654105H2, which is the subsection in 2011, the statute that would apply to Ms. Rizal. That's the subsection for naphthoylindols. This is all prominent in this case because in 2010 and 2011, the Kansas legislature undertook an extensive effort to overhaul the Controlled Substances Act in Kansas in response to designer drugs. Kansas was on the leading edge of taking part in amending the Controlled Substances Act into a new structure. If you go back to the supplement from 2010 and look at the Controlled Substances Act, naphthoylindols are nowhere to be found. When you pull out the 2011 supplement and turn to 654105H2, that's where you'll find all of these new classes of controlled substances that were prohibited in 2011 by the legislature. Naphthoylindols were one of those classes. This new class structure that went into place in 2011 was a very big change to how controlled substances were convicted in the state of Kansas, how they were prosecuted, because it sought to capture many of the substances that were on a chemist's radar when they were designing new drugs to try to circumvent the law. My opposing counsel points to Utah and Pennsylvania as describing AM2201 as an analog. Those states do define AM2201 as an analog, but Kansas does not. Those states do not prohibit possession of a naphthoylindol. Kansas does. Kansas has since before Ms. Rizal was convicted, since before police ever visited her store. That's the significant difference. In Kansas statutes, an analog has a definition. It carries significant characteristics that it is similar in chemical nature to a listed substance, that it has similar impacts on the human body, or that it is believed to have similar impacts on the human body and so on. That's a significant definition. But also when you work your way down the definition of an analog, the statute explicitly states that controlled substance analogs do not include controlled substances themselves. That's significant here because naphthoylindols are listed. When they're listed in Schedule I in Kansas, that means they are straight listed controlled substances. They are not analogs because they're listed in the statute. So we're out of this entire analog realm when we're contemplating what Ms. Rizal was convicted of. The Pennsylvania case is not applicable here. The Utah case is not applicable here. If you search Pennsylvania and Utah's Controlled Substances Acts that were in effect at the time those cases were handled, the word naphthoylindol appears nowhere. That's because naphthoylindols were not listed as controlled substances by those states. The only course of action the state could take when naphthoylindols were not listed was to try to capture them under their state's analog framework. 
Before 2011, that's how the state of Kansas would have charged a case such as this. It would have charged Ms. Rizal with an analog. But when the legislature took that step to add naphthoylindols to the schedule, it removed naphthoylindols from the analog realm and placed them in the controlled substances category. When you place this item in that controlled substances category, you're no longer in that McFadden framework and we're no longer stuck working our way through that thicket of whether or not McFadden's heightened knowledge requirement applies to this case. Counsel, I, I don't want to take all your time with this chemical question because I do want to hear about your view of the proper mens rea for this crime. But as I understand your opponent's argument now, it's that the lab report was erroneous, made a mistake, was incorrect when it identified naphthalindol as being present in the packets. And that somehow the state bore an added burden to prove up its own lab report in the chemical con the, the 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 I'll just say its correctness, that it was correct. What what's your response to that? It was never challenged at the district court. It was accepted by the district court and essentially by the parties as well. Both of the parties stipulated that the lab report accurately described what was in those packets. When the parties signed off on the stipulation that described the chemical makeup of what was found in Ms. Rizal's packets, the parties agreed those were the facts. That's what the signatures on the stipulation say. So to come back now and challenge the contents of the lab report, this is not the proper venue to do that. When Ms. Rizal signed off on the stipulation, she accepted the words on the lab report as describing what were in the packets that she possessed. The stipulation actually says the lab report's accurate or it says the lab report says what it says? It says, it says what's in the packets. Okay. It doesn't use the word accurate, but it points to the lab report as being a description, a chemical description of what was contained in the packets that were seized from her store. Didn't, uh, just now you've confused me. I thought paragraph, when I'm just looking at it, Paragraph 17 of the stipulation had both parties agreeing that the substance that was checked, the, the substance that the lab looked at was illegal and, and the cannabinoid. It, it lists them as, I believe, synthetic cannabinoids, <clears throat> and it states to, it, it points to the lab report. It adopts, it, I don't have the wording in front of me from that stipulation, but it references directly to the lab report that was admitted as an exhibit. That's my recollection of what the, the wording on the stipulation is. I'm looking at that, and I don't, I, I agree, we, we really want to talk about better things, but the lab report confirms the packets contain illegal synthetic cannabinoids, commonly called K2, period. I mean, that's what it says. So it seems like everybody's agreed this is illegal. I agree. I think we all do. The, the, the hair splitting we're doing now is whether or not it's illegal under the Controlled Substances Act or whether it's illegal as an analog. Uh, and though the, the letter of the wording of that stipulation does not say as much. But, but K2 is a controlled substance. It is. It absolutely is. And the stipulation says it was K2. Correct as does the journal entry, as do numerous other sources within this case. When you look through the complaint, the stipulation, the lab report, the verdict, the journal entry, and the Court of Appeals, nowhere will you find Ms. Rizal as being described as having been convicted of possessing an analog. All of those sources point to her possessing a controlled substance. The state did not raise this issue of it not being an analog until we arrived here because it wasn't argued anywhere below that this was an analog. That's why the state responded with the argument that McFadden doesn't apply because all of the primary evidence in this case points to this being con a controlled substance. So, Can that, you move to the, the knowledge requirement? We can, and I, I, I want to because when we were here back in May, you and I had a, a conversation about that knowledge requirement in a controlled substances case, and I do want to revisit that because in the time that I've had since our original oral argument here, I have a correction to make to statements that I made previously in May. 
Previously in May, I had responded to questions about what level of knowledge or intent was required under the Controlled Substances Act in Kansas. And I do not believe it would be just for me to argue that the Controlled Substances Act imposes strict liability. I don't believe as though that's the case. And the reason for that is, is revisiting both the, the statute itself and the definition of possession but I also was able to find one case from this court, although it does not directly uh, interpret the Kansas Controlled Substances Act, it was interpreting a municipal statute that was largely identical to the Kansas Controlled Substances Act. The case was City of Overland Park versus McBride, found uh, in volume 253 of the Kansas Reporters, page 774. It's a 1993 case that was interpreting the municipal code in the city of Overland Park. And one argument there was made that that Controlled Substances Act imposed strict liability. This court found it was, it, it did not further describe it as being a specific intent or what level in, of intent applies. But this court did find that the Controlled Substances Act in that case was a general intent crime. And it described knowledge as being the requirement that was that had to be satisfied by the state. The reason I revisit that is when I look at the Controlled Substances Act in Kansas, it's silent on mens rea. We talked about that last time. It states nothing as to the intent level required, intent or knowledge or reckless. We have the other statutes, the other uh, body of law in Kansas that says when a, when a criminal statute is silent as to mens rea, one still applies unless the statute explicitly dispenses with it. This statute I've, I've already conceded does not explicitly state that no mens rea applies. So here we do have either reckless, knowledgeable, or intentional conduct that's going to apply. When we work our way into the definition of possession, possession requires some level of knowing conduct. My argument here today is that level of conduct being knowing applies to the act, the conduct of possession itself. When we go back to the, co the Controlled Substances Act, it has no mens rea within it. And so... So you have to it, know that you possess the object, but you, you don't have to know the content of the object. Correct. So someone gives me a plate of brownies I knowingly possess those brownies without having any knowledge that they are marijuana brownies. And I've now violated, or I'm, I'm at least knowingly in possession. You're knowingly in possession of them. But what I would argue is under the Controlled Substances Act, the state still must prove one of the other three, one of the three levels of intent that's required of the crime itself. The knowing conduct is the possession. It's within the definition of possession. Knowing applies to the possession. But whether or not it's a controlled substance, I believe the state is still tasked with proving you were either reckless or knowledgeable or intentionally possessing a controlled substance. I can't get away from that. The nature of it. The nature of it, precisely. And where does that come from? That comes from the fact that the statute is silent on mens rea, but there's other statutes that say when the statute is silent, the state still right. must prove a men mental right. a culpability. Yeah, but it also. It also says that if it's limited to one element, it's not necessarily applicable to all elements. True. So. And that's why I do not extend the knowledge requirement to all of the elements. Why would you extend it at all? Why would I? Why Aren't would... you still extending it from the possession to the, the nature of what's possessed? I'm only extending that other statute that says a criminal statute that's silent on mens rea still must carry one mm -hmm. and the state can satisfy it by proving either reckless, knowing, or intentional conduct. How so, does, uh, I, still, I still think you're doing an extra step, um, but, but I'm also arguing against what I was talking to you about last time you were here. I think we both are. All of, the, yeah, all of the case law that we have that says that you can use um, someone's guilty knowledge, and, which implies that it has some relevance to proving the crime, but we will return to that subject. I think my colleague has a question for you. How does KSA 215202F fit into this? And that's the provision that says, if the definition of a crime prescribes a culpable mental state that is sufficient for the commission of the crime without distinguishing among the material elements thereof, such provision shall apply to all material elements of the crime unless a contrary purpose plainly appears. 
where I would get there is that it, the statute is silent as to mens rea, but within the definition of just the word possession, elsewhere in the statute in 5111, possession is defined, and also it's defined within the Controlled Substances Act the same way. It's defined as conduct that's knowing. So that knowing, and that's the argument that I was offering in response to Justice Stiegel, the knowing conduct, that mental culpability requirement does only apply to the act or the conduct of possession. Under that statute, under, under other statutes, if there's a culpability requirement that's expressly attached to one element, it only attaches to that one, and it need not be attached to the others. Uh, it, is that what F says? I mean, that's I'm right. having trouble um, because it says if it prescribes a mental state sufficient for the commission of the crime without distinguishing among the elements, the provisions apply to all material elements. And that would be in the circumstance where the mental state requirement does not distinguish between any of the elements, but here it does. So you're saying that it must be explained. Uh, okay. And so instead of that statute being applicable, I would argue that the 2011 version of 215204A is the one that applies, where it states that proof of a mental state does not, uh, excuse me, that was, that's the mistake of law and mistake of fact one. Um, 5202G from 2011, when the definition of a crime applies a mental state to one element, it does not apply to the other elements the other elements need not have any mens rea requirement. So uh, just cutting to the chase, I'm confused as to what your position is the state had to prove with respect to um, Ms. Rizal's knowledge about the, the content of the packets. My argument today is that what, Ms. what the state was tasked with proving was that her conduct of possession of, of those packets of any of the material had to be knowing. Right, which meant she had to knowingly exert control over the packets. Correct. Without knowing what was in the packets. Correct. But that her conduct on the larger scale of it being a controlled substance her had to be- Her e awareness of the nature of it. Her okay. awareness of the nature of the conduct. Precise. Precisely. Had to either be reckless, knowing, or intentional. Isn't that McFadden? I, I, I'm confused. You're, you've been just saying McFadden doesn't apply all along. And... McFadden doesn't apply, and McFadden doesn't allow for reckless possession. McFadden requires, it requires a knowledge level that's higher than reckless. It requires either an awareness of the, the identity of the substance. Let me, okay, I understand. You're, you're saying that the state may have this, this additional ability to prove up the crime based on recklessness. Precisely. But, um, let me draw your attention to the, uh, let's see, I think it's 5701A, definition of, the generic definition of knowingly or knowledge. And that statute talks about a person acting knowingly with respect to the nature of the person's conduct when they're aware, so it talks about awareness, aware of the nature of the conduct. Um, so what, what, what does that phrase nature of mean? In this case, that means the nature of the conduct was possessing those packets. Well, but just generically, isn't there a difference between being aware of your conduct and being aware of the nature of your conduct? In other words, couldn't I, couldn't I do something with awareness of what I was doing, but be blissfully unaware of the nature of the conduct? I mean, this is how human misunderstandings occur all the time. I do something that I'm unaware is offensive. I know I do it, but I'm unaware of the nature of the conduct. Of how it's being received by somebody right. else. Of, and, and isn't that an important element of the definition of knowing in Kansas law? To the extent that it's an important element of the definition of knowing, what we risk in imputing too much into that nature of the conduct descriptor is we risk wading into permitting a mistake of law or a mistake of fact. Well, defense. to me, this is a mistake of fact, arguably at least, it could be a mistake of fact provision. Right. It could be saying, and I want to apply this directly to the possession definition. I mean, Understood. The statute says possession is must be knowing. Right. And this appears to me to at least create the possibility that the legislature intended to preclude mistakes of fact. 
from from the definition of knowingly possess. And I agree the legislature did, especially when, when we're in the context of a general intent crime such as this one, where the legislature has explicitly precluded the application of a mistake of law or mistake of fact defense as being available to a general intent crime such as possession of drugs. If we are to require that heightened knowledge level in a case such as this, then we're tasking the state with proving that the defendant knew what the substance was. But on the same hand, that defendant is precluded from presenting a defense saying, I didn't know what the substance was. The defendant cannot present a mistake of fact or a mistake of law defense for this general intent crime. Yet the state is tasked with proving the knowledge and the two conflict. And we would end up with a set of jury instructions that would just endlessly well, confound a well, jury. Why can't the defendant present a mistake of fact defense? Because it's barred statutorily in Kansas for general intent crimes. Well, walk through that a bit for me. I mean, is, is it, you, you just are taking that as a blanket bar and then you're just saying, well, this is a general intent crime, so therefore... I'm not taking the, the Controlled Substances Act as a general intent crime. I'm taking that from case law from this court, that it's a general intent crime. And I'm taking the bar on mistake of fact and mistake of law defenses from the Kansas statutes. That's where it's found. There are exceptions as to when mistake of law or mistake of fact can still be asserted, such as when somebody relies upon an official interpretation of a law or a, a repealed act or a overturned case law or something to that effect. There have been lots of confusion between case law use of the phrase general intent and statutory use of the phrase general intent. And I'm not sure you can just cross apply them that easily. We've actually said that the general intent may not mean what it once did under the recodified criminal code. Yeah. No, go ahead. Answer, you can answer that question. <laughs> you have stated that, absolutely. I don't know what we're left with doing then when we're encountered with a circumstance where a statute is described by this, a, a, a crime is defined by this court as general intent, and yet there remain statutory provisions on the books that bar certain defenses to general intent crimes. It's a mess. We could all agree there. Yeah, well, how do you defend against a, if the mens rea for knowing what is in the packet is reckless? That's what you, you're, you're saying. How do you defend against that if you can't state, I wasn't reckless, I didn't know what was in there? How, how, how do you defend against it? In Justice Stegall's example of the brownies, the argument the state might try to make in that being reckless conduct is if we were to establish that Justice Stegall knew the individual who gave him the brownies, knew their history, knew if they had any uh, drug involvement and so on. So that's where the state could attempt to establish res reckless conduct in that circumstance. And he would need to defend against that presumably by making the opposite arguments, making I did not know his involvement with, with drug sales or with drug possession or his baking habits and so on. Why, why can't that same defense be offered here? I didn't know that this contained the, the the active ingredient. I, I had no idea that it did. Why, why can't that be? It, 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 it could be, but it in, in also... The same, in, the same, in the same, if it's reckless, then I, I'm not being reckless. I didn't, I didn't understand this. And, and I understand how that would be the defense that would be applicable, but at the same time, it seems to run, run headfirst into the bar on mistake of fact or mistake of law defenses, because the problem it, that we're getting does. at is that this is a prohibited substance. That's a legal description, that's a law. And to say, I'm ignorant as to the law that this was prohibited or that that substance was in there. Yeah, um, okay. yeah we, I understand the quandary here. We run into that, right. that quandary. We, we have, as I put in, in my supplemental brief, we, we run into this mobile strip of, of a never ending right. loop. You would, argue, I mean, you, you would agree though, that if we just look at the next to last paragraph of the Court of Appeals opinion where they lay out the facts and this is why the act was knowing. For the purposes of this case, you don't care what the standard is because you're gonna, you think you meet it no matter what burden we put on you, right? For this case, absolutely. For this case, right. 
Absolutely. I would have taken more time today to argue sufficiency if I felt that w that was a, a gray area, but I feel as though that was sufficiently briefed uh, and the Court of Appeals findings were sufficient there to establish her conduct. Counsel, we've uh, taken up more than your allotted time with our questions. Would you like 30 seconds to wrap up or do you think you've made your points? I'll, t I'll take the invitation. Thank you. What we're asking here, Judge, is that you, Justices, is that you find sufficient evidence here under any of those standards. This is not the case to be deciding whether or not a heightened mens rea requirement is applicable to analog possession in Kansas. This is not that case because Ms. Rizal was not convicted of possessing and distributing analogs. She was convicted of possessing a listed controlled substance. McFadden is expressly conditioned upon the analog nature of the substance that was possessed. McFadden doesn't apply here in Kansas legally. It shouldn't be adopted by this court into our jurisprudence in our Controlled Substances Act because our Controlled Substances Act carries significant differences from the Federal Controlled Substances Act on mens rea requirements and ask that you affirm the Court of Appeals ruling that affirmed Ms. Rizal's convictions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. If it please the Court. Justice Tegall, if, if I can return to something you said at the outset before we uh, turn to mens rea, I'm very concerned about something that came up. I'm not arguing that the lab report was mistaken at all. This is not a situation where naphtholindole is in a list and it's an isolated word. If you go and look at 6540105H2, naphtholindole is actually a defined controlled substance. It says any compound containing a 3,1 naphtholindole structure with substitution at the nitrogen uh, and atom of the indole ring by and, and then it lists out eight things, alkal, haloalkal, alkanel, I can't even pronounce these, but they're there. And the point being, the lab report does use the word naphtholindole, but it's a different naphtholindole if you look at the lab report. It's not the one listed in the statute. The one in the lab report is, it says on all of these, confirmed 1-5-fluoropentyl-3-1-naphtholindole AM2201. That is not in 6540105. The state has proven an analog under a statute that doesn't prohibit against it. That's why there is insufficient evidence here. If the state wanted to convince the trier of fact or the court of appeals or this court that what is in the lab report, the naphtholindole defined in the lab report, broke Kansas law, the state needed an expert. Ms. Rizal didn't need an expert. That's not a burden shifting affirmative defense. If you charge somebody with breaking a drug statute, you've got to prove that the drug they possessed or distributed was in the statute. This is different than just saying green leafy substance marijuana. Our statute- But, but counsel, isn't the trial court limited to the stipulation that the parties entered into and submitted? And the stipulation paragraph 17, both parties stipulated it was a controlled substance and was illegal. If I may, what the parties stipulated to was that this was a synthetic cannabinoid Okay. listed in the lab report, and it's an illegal cannabinoid. But you still have to take the lab report, which was attached to the stipulation. I mean, this isn't something that I've just called out of a bunch of police reports. This was actually attached to the stipulation. This is the evidence. And you have to look at this lab report, and you have to look at this statute and see if the illegal cannabinoid here is what's actually prescribed illegally by the statute, and they're not. They're two different things. So if we go to the Fitzgerald case, the state charged a controlled substance offense, but they proved an analog offense. And it's too late for them to go back and try to correct it by amending by interlineation the amended complaint. The amended complaint talks about 654105. That's what it, it accuses her of violating. She didn't violate that statute. And I, you're, you're escaping uh, any kind of procedural bar, according to you, because you raised sufficiency of the evidence 
and the state had to anticipate every kind of insufficiency you might have been arguing? What, what I argued from the get-go was that this is an analog and therefore McFadden should apply. And that if you're looking at the McFadden elements, the state didn't prove them. The state came back. I didn't raise this. The state came back after the May 4th don't order. don't you have a responsibility to raise it? That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, uh, Ordinarily, we would put it on the defense. If they want to make a Fitzgerald argument, then they need to make a Fitzgerald argument. I'll be honest with you. I didn't realize it. I don't think anybody realized it until the state came forward in its supplemental brief and said, time out. The reason McFadden doesn't apply is this isn't an analog. I've always said it is an analog. And they said, it's not an analog, it's a controlled substance statute. Look at the statute we charged her under. All I did was look at the statute they charged her under. I literally, this is all I did. I looked at the statute, and then I pulled out the lab report, and I saw that they were different. And that's why I come before you today and say, this case looks a lot different than it did when we were here May 1st, but here's the reason. The state is the one that pointed out, here's what we charged her with. And they said that this lab report says naphthalindol, so therefore it satisfies. So I'm coming in front of you saying, wait a minute, just because the lab report says naphthalindol, that doesn't conclusively end the analysis. And the reason being is because naphthalindol is a specifically defined chemical compound in the statute. The lab report doesn't have it. So I, 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 I knew that there was going to be a discussion about preservation today, but I'm not the one who brought the issue up. The state brought it up, trying to keep the conviction the state pointed out it used the wrong statute to convict her. And Fitzgerald came down after we were here, May, May 1st. I, I believe Fitzgerald came down in, in August, I think, middle of August. But its holding would be aptly applied here under Griffith v. Kentucky. This case is still on direct appeal as I stand here today. And uh, so that's, that's where I, I think we are. I, I've probably used up my rebuttal time, but uh, it was... Very important to me to point out, I'm not arguing that the lab report's mistaken. I'm arguing that the lab report proves she was charged under the wrong statute. Thank you, counsel. We thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.